when was the last time you put your adventurers on a boat? And if you did, was it a big boat, galleon with big masts, or was it a rowing boat? Well, there's also little dinghies like these. Boats like these don't give much room for equipment space. Or importantly, passengers. That means you're going to have to work. Whether it's launching the boat down a ramp like this into the water, or knowing how to use the sails in the wind, or navigating narrow channels in the water between all the boys, if the water even has boys put out. Coming into dock on a jetty like this can be extremely hazardous when the wind is up. A sailboat moves rather poorly in, at slow speed and if the wind is strong it can push you into shore and if the shoreline is shallow that can capsize you. Regrettably that piece of advice and the opportunity for a skill check comes from my own experience. In my time at sea the one thing I learned was that the biggest threat to sailing wasn't krakens or monsters or sahagen but it was the sea itself and if not the sea then the wind. One time traveling in a vessel not much larger than this one, I was going over overfalls in a 4-6 and found half the vessel submerged. Overfalls are like a static wave on the sea surface caused by sharp drops in the seabed beneath it. And as the water comes over it, it creates this wave, which in this case, in these conditions, was about six foot. In addition to that, the wind was whipping up a hell of a swell as well. So as we crashed over the overfalls, the front of the boat had a wave come down on top of it. It was about, well, several feet underwater at the very front. Luckily, everyone on board was at the back of the boat. And then as what happens is the boat, filled with air and being naturally buoyant, starts rushing up, getting quicker and quicker as the closer it gets to the back to the surface. And then, of course, once it breaks the surface of the water, it starts decelerating, slams back down, just as another wave is coming over the front of the boat. That was probably the most terrified I've ever been at sea. And I've been in stronger conditions than a 4.6. One time, just as a passenger on a ferry, it was, I think, a 4.8. And it was so bad that almost every passenger on board the ship was, well, being sick. Myself having a few sea legs to me, knew to stand right in the middle of the ship, so that I was on the center of gravity. So whichever way the ship rolled, I was getting the least movement. That was great until I was trying to tell my friends to come and stand with me and every other passenger heard and I was okay in the middle for a while until I needed to go to the loo and then when I came back I couldn't get anywhere near the middle and I too came a cropper to seasickness that day. I wish I could say that was the only time but unfortunately one time working on a big ship I was crossing the Bay of Biscay and well Anybody who has ever sailed that water knows it's uh, very shallow, very rocky, so it creates a very turbulent surface. Yeah, that day too. One of the most dangerous hazards for small ships in modern times is lobster pots. They're little metal cages about, oh, so big, uh, probably bigger. Uh, can't, I'd have to get a long way from the camera to show you, but they're not that large. They stick above the water with just a little flag to mark where they are but underneath the water they are metal cages and if, you, if your boat goes over one there's a good chance it will foul your prop. If it does, you've got to kill the engine. Those metal cages will rip your prop shaft to shreds. It'll do awful things to the gearbox on your boat. So somebody has to get a wetsuit on, get in the water and get this bent up metal cage from away from your propeller, which may or may not have a lobster in it that's somewhat angry. Yeah, that too. In the D&D &D world, you might not have lobsters and metal cages and propellers on your boats, but you could have rope cages to catch some kind of obscure underwater fish that tangle up in your rudder and involve somebody having to go into the water. And it's as someone goes in the water, that the sahuagin or whatever other watery creatures you've got in your world emerge to the surface and attack your vessel. And don't forget, if somebody is boarding your vessel, they won't just do it on the deck. 
If you're on a big ship that's got gun ports, they're going to come through there, they're going to come into the rigging and swing and across. They'll attack the boat from every angle that they can. In these wintry, snowy conditions that you can see here on the path, the weather is actually quite tame right now. It'll be quite safe to sail. In fact, you'd probably struggle to get much speed up at all. But what if the weather was so cold that this lake was frozen over? Then we enter a whole new world of treachery. You can't sail across. You're going to have to walk across it. And in some places, the ice will be thin. In others, maybe it's cut thin deliberately by those things that live in the lake. I found two sources of water so far into this lake. This is the first. It appears that water's being pumped in at this end near this old dam. And if you want an interesting fantasy encounter, how about biggering it? Have water gushing in and whooshing up into a, a geyser that feeds the lake. I'd guess that's just water that's being pumped in from nearby drainage ditches and irrigation. But at the other end, there's a little stream that feeds this lake. That's probably its main water source, I'd guess. And in the summer, we came here and tried to film uh, a video about lakes, and we had to cut it short. This is what happened. Roll the tape. I am here at Pittsford Reservoir. This is the road DM exploring lakes. When it comes to things like these estuaries, in terms of crossing them, no matter if you're in the mountains or so on, they can prove a bit of a problem. This is my unfortunate attempt at crossing an estuary, and I'm not even wearing any armour. Obviously, I rolled a natural one, didn't really look at my surroundings properly, didn't see there was a bottle half sticking out of the mud over there, but to me that looks okay to cross. But yeah, just imagine if you were wearing armour, or if you were busy getting chased by something and you didn't have the time to think. This could prove quite deadly, actually, because... It didn't look okay to cross to me, just, just so you know. I. I'd already turned my back and went to walk away because there was no way that was crossable. But like I said, natural one, thank you, Becky. But imagine if you were getting chased or if, if you don't think enough about your surroundings. In fact, I even almost got stuck, which would have been equally embarrassing, possibly even more so. Uh, I did manage to pull myself out in the end. It was hilarious. Thanks, babe. Now this is quite a small reservoir. If you were to come across this whilst travelling across the land, the most it would delay you is an hour, hour and a half as you walked around it. But you don't even have to go into fantasy worlds to make your lakes bigger. There's the Great Lakes in North America. And if you come across those, the only realistic way to get around them is to cross them. Because walking around is gonna take an awful lot of extra time on your journey. And if you're crossing a lake, what if you're at the hands of an unscrupulous captain who halfway across, him and the crew decide you've got to pay more. And if you don't, it's in the drink with you. Are you wearing your armour? Because you're going to sink if you are. So check with your players first. Who's bold enough to wear armour at sea? It could also go rusty, especially if it's something like chainmail and it's not protected. That would be a nightmare to clean up after. So maybe even scare your chainmail wearing players into taking off their armour, and so then they've got to fight on board a ship and if they win who's going to sail the boat? It's a dilemma and the players may just have to pay up. So we've talked a bit about encounters that can happen when you're on the water or at sea or on a lake but what about the ecology of living next to a lake or on the coast? You see to a large extent your diet is going to be fish but for locals living near the water, fish isn't the only catch. The land around here is very fertile from all the nutrients brought by the water. There there buddy. You might even have some peoples living off of insects which have a habit of swarming or maybe, maybe those insects are the most dangerous thing about the place. Of 
course, it's fertile land, so there's lots of flora as well. So diets here can be pretty balanced. You've got fertile land for grazing animals. But what happens if there's a drought? Everyone and every herd of animals, every creature for hundreds of miles around are going to be descending on the local water source on the big lake just to get water. In times of drought, lakes can be like a, a refugee camp for every nasty in the D&D monster manual. But lakes aren't just a source of water. They're also a place to wash your clothes and they're your sewage system as well which means you can get outbreaks of cholera and other diseases. You could even have a pandemic when your adventurers arrive. And the thing about pandemics, when the cause isn't understood, who's to blame? So whatever monstrosity you're preparing to throw at your players, whatever encounter you want to put in, Lakes and coasts are an amazing place to do it. Right now, I am stood on a walkway that is half a metre wide. Either side of me is mud that I know just by looking at it. That is horrendously deep. I could go in 10, 12 inches at some points in that mud, three or four in others. This is uh, quagmire ground here. Horrendously dangerous. I don't think I'm going to take this path to the very end. I think I'm going to go back up to the main pathway. So whatever thing you're going to throw at your player, lakes have it in abundance. Water and waterways and coasts are an amazing environment to set adventures in. There's an old saying in D&D to never get on the boat because whenever the GM puts you on a boat there's going to be an attack of some kind. But the real hazards when you get on the water aren't from monsters and things in the D&D monster manual. They're from the water itself and the weather and the wind. I remember the first time we tried to film this video, and this is our third attempt, the very first time and Jason was presenting to camera, it was so windy. When we went back to look at the rushes that we'd filmed, we couldn't hear a thing he'd said. We were actually going sailing that day in a little dinghy and even though I've, I've, I've not got much experience in dingers, but I had sold them before, there was no way I was going out in that. And the second time, obviously, <laughs> Jason had an incident crossing the little tiny stream that was feeding the other end of the river, but put your adventurers in this situation, in all of their armor and equipment and bags of loot and holding treasure chests, <laughs> everything else your heroes are, trying to get away with carrying. Put them on the water and all of the things that they've got to prepare them for every eventuality suddenly start to work against them. And that is what is so marvelous about the sea and about traveling on water. And if you can capture that in your games, that's a little victory for the environment that gives so much atmosphere. When I think about all the times I've been to sea, when I've been working and when I've been doing it for pleasure or, or just crossing the English Channel to get to another country. The sea has always given me stories. I travelled in a hovercraft. I, I crossed the channel once in the Herald of Free Enterprise and driving to Austria when I was very young and on the way back I heard on the radio the Herald of Free had sunk, killing I think it was like 50 odd people. And it was due to crew negligence and I was meant to be travelling on it the next day. It, could have been us and it wasn't so even when the sea didn't give me a story it still gave me a story even this the presence of an invasive non-native species of shrimp dicaragamarus velocis the sea is full of stories so isn't it about time we dedicated some of our stories to the sea Thank you for watching. I've been Becky Rose from Para Geeks, and we'll see you next time. Oh, and if this does go out before Christmas, which I think it will, Merry Christmas. Bye.